Hi, I'm Chris Fitzgerald and thanks for tuning into the Jazz Bass Video Technique Series. This video is a little bit different from previous videos in that this is really a music theory video more than a bass technique video. What this video consists of is basically a narrated book chapter in which uh, I'll be reading a bunch of material about walking bass line construction, target notes, approach notes, and then getting into to very great detail about all the types of um, ways that we approach target notes in beginning baseline construction. So as you look at your screen, um, what you're going to see is on the left and middle of the screen, actually I should do that the other way, left and middle of your screen, you're going to see basically the text of the book chapter um, scrolling by as I, I read it out loud. And on the right hand side of your screen, right over here on this side, you're going to see two hands and a bass neck. And so what's going to happen is that um, I'll be talking about the concepts involved in the, in the construction of bass lines, reading aloud from the, from the chapter and making some, some commentary along the way. And then by the time we reach the musical examples, the hands are going to sort of start to play the example and you'll hear the examples as you're looking at the examples uh, in musical notation in the chapter. And so uh, there's a, there are 17 musical examples, I think, 11 of those are actually played on the bass, and so it's a very long video. So I would advise everybody to make use of the indexing right underneath the, the view screen on your YouTube channel. You're going to see a very detailed index of what subjects are being covered and where and what, um, what musical examples are being played at what time by timestamp of the video. So please make use of that. It'll help you uh, get to where you need to get uh, in and out more quickly and not have to listen to the whole video. But I, I hope you enjoy the video. It's uh, the kind of thing where um, those who want to really get in depth on the subject will be able to do so and those who want to just get a small piece of information and see that described will be able to do that as well. So the topics that will be covered in this chapter are the concept of target notes, approach notes, harmonic rhythm, non-stepwise target notes, uh, sorry, non-stepwise approach notes, stepwise approach notes, and all the four categories of stepwise approach notes. The examples being played from, I believe, example, example 10 onward um, are all about uh, the changes to George Gershwin's I Got Rhythm. And so what you'll hear is there will be a discussion of a certain type of approach note, and then the example will show, and you'll hear and see it played, the example will show what the progression sounds like when you use only that type of approach note, and it's going to go systematically through all the different possible types of approach notes. And um, at the end of each section, you'll hear an example played in which those types are combined. So I hope you enjoy the video, and I'll see you again at the end. Okay, getting started. A target note is a note that's played with the intent to outline a chord in a chord progression, usually on the first beat that the chord appears within the progression. For beginning bass lines, the root of the chord is the most common target note to play because it's the fundamental note of the chord. An approach note is a note that leads into the target note in an aurally logical way. And we're going to spend some time talking about what that term aurally logical means. Approach notes usually occur on the beat before a target note. When we use the term harmonic rhythm, it refers to the rate at which chords change in a progression. In 4-4 time, the most common harmonic rhythms are one chord per measure or two chords per measure. It's common for the harmonic rhythm to vary within most chord progressions. When the harmonic rhythm of a progression of a song is two chords per bar, the bass player will often play a target note on beats 1 and 3 and an approach note on beats 2 and 4. The following is an example of a common bass line construction when the harmonic rhythm is moving at the rate of two chords per bar. Target notes here are designated with a T and approach notes are designated with an A. If you look at example one, the chords are changing twice a bar on beat one and beat three. And on each of those downbeats where the chords occur, beat one and beat three, the strong beats, we're gonna play a target note, which we're gonna play usually a root of the chord. And then on beats two and four, will play an approach note leading into that target note. An example two shows that since the root is the most common target note used in beginning bass lines, a bass line for the following progression could be constructed like this. 
So in example two, the progression is D minor, G7, C minor, F7, so a basis, the beginning basis, would likely play D on beat one, G on beat three, C on beat one, F on beat three, and play an approach note leading to each one of those notes on beats two and four directly before they happen. Where the harmonic rhythm is one chord per bar, the groups of target and approach notes are separated by two beats of space where the player has to decide how to fill the space between them. So in example three, we see the chord changes only on beat one of each measure, which leaves us with a target note that we know what that is, and an approach note leading into the next target on beat four, and leaves beats two and three open for interpretation. Using the root note for each target note, a bass line for the following progression could be constructed as followed, follows. Notes on beats two and three are designated with question marks here. So we play a D on beat one, an approach note on beat four, leading to the G on beat one, approach to C, approach to F. And what's interesting about this example is that it shows that a bass player could play a lot of different things on beats two and three and still have the basic function of the line remain intact. Based on the preceding examples, it could be argued that the concept behind much baseline construction, at least in the beginning stages, could be simplified down to the following big picture formulas. Where the harmonic rhythm is two chords per bar, the player is thinking only about target notes and how to approach them. This is the same as example one. So basically, it's target approach, target approach, target approach, and the player doesn't have to think that much about what they're doing. They just have to execute. They have to get to these target notes, and they have to know how to approach them. Example 6 shows that where the harmonic rhythm is one chord per bar, the player is thinking about target note on beat 1, an approach note on beat 4, and two variable notes to flesh out the harmony and lead to the next approach note. And again, these notes on beat 2 and 3 could be a lot of different things, and the line could still work, and the line would basically still sound roughly the same as far as the function is going. You're landing on a target note on beat one, you're approaching it on beat four, and you're filling in the space on beats two and three. And this leads to an observation about baseline construction, especially in the beginning phases, which is very important. And I'd like to take a little time to flesh that out here. The preceding examples illustrate an important point. Progressions that feature a faster harmonic rhythm may be difficult to execute on the instrument, especially at faster tempos, like think back to the introduction of this video which was uh, rhythm changes at 3.08, and we're going to come back to rhythm changes at medium up tempos later on. They may be difficult to, inst to execute on the instrument because of the number of details that need to be realized in order for the outlining of the progression to take place, but they're actually very simple on a conceptual level. So in other words, when there's a lot of chords, it's difficult to, to make all of those changes in time, but it's very easy to think about what you want to play. The number of details that need to be realized in order for the outlining of the progression to take place, um, but they're, cons they're simple on a conceptual level because the player is left with fewer choices to make than when the chords are spaced farther apart. In example five, and we'll review example five for a second, just T-A, 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 Assuming that the target note cho chosen will be the root, the player's only real-time choice is what kind of approach note to use. But in example six, and we'll scroll back up to example six here. In example six, the player has two open-ended choices to make for each chord change in addition to choosing the type of approach note to use to lead into the next target. So this one's a little bit, you've got more time to get from target to target, but you also have to make decisions almost every beat about how you're gonna fill this space. In progressions where the harmonic rhythm is even slower, i.e. where there is a new chord only every two, four, or eight bars, this effect is multiplied, resulting in many more decisions which must be made by the player in real time. So it's actually more difficult, um, creatively speaking, to, for, to create a bass line where there's less information given to you. If you're playing a song like So What or Impressions where you have D minor for eight bars, um, you don't have anywhere that you absolutely have to be, so it's easier to execute that line, but it's much more difficult to, um, to construct that line because you have to make a lot of choices about where you're going to place target notes and while you're going to approach them, and you have a lot of creative choices to make. Whereas in a, a song where the harmonic rhythm is two chords per bar, 
the choices are already made for you. And this is an important point that I think every player comes to term with, terms with as they become more experienced players. So at this point, for the level of baseline construction we're discussing, the root of each chord is usually the best choice for the sake of simplicity of thought and clarity of the overall musical result. And this leads us to a discussion of the different types of approach notes most commonly found in walking lines. So for the type of approach notes, earlier in this document we defined the term approach note as a note that leads into a target note in an aurally logical way. The key question then is how to define the words aurally logical. For our purposes here, we'll examine two general categories of approach notes, then get into more specific details of each from there. And we're, we'll start with non-stepwise approach notes. As the name suggests, these are approach notes that lead to the target note of the next chord change by intervallic leap rather than by step. The most common way that this is done while still maintaining the RL logic mentioned above is to jump to the target note from a chord tone that is part of the previous harmony. An example is given here. And starting with this example, uh, all the rest of the examples in this video will have um, musical examples to go with what you're actually seeing on the screen. So on the right hand side of your screen you'll see a, a two hands playing and a neck of a bass and they'll be playing the example and you'll be listening to the example uh, while you watch the hands play the example. So this is an example of basically the line which simply outlines each chord and jumps to the root of the next chord from wherever it happened to be at the end of outlining the chord that it's on. So every um, every note in every beat of this example is just a chord tone and it jumps to the next to the root of the next chord just from wherever it was. And here then is example seven. In this example, the bass line consists of simple arpeggiations of each chord, giving the overall effect of a simple blues bass line. And we'll move on to a slightly embellished version of this kind of line, which is typical of a basic boogie-woogie type bass line, as in the following example, example 8. So while both of the previous examples are certainly aurally logical and typical of the style, it could be argued that when it comes to connections between each chord and the next, most of, most of the approach notes that occur right before the root of the next chord aren't really approach notes at all, but are simply part of the preceding harmony. In other words, in all the lines above in the previous two examples that we saw, if the music were to stop on beat 4 right before a new chord was about to be outlined, the listener would have a great sense of what harmony had just been played, but little or no sense of what the next chord root was likely to be if they didn't already know the progression. But two of the approach notes resolutions in example 8, marked by asterisks above, and I'll try and scroll to where we can get to those, are arguably stronger and more compelling resolutions because in addition to continuing the ornamented arpeggio pattern that the line begins with, they also resolve to the root of the next chord by step rather than by leap. And here they are. Here at the end of measure four, going into measure five, this D leads to this E flat by step, even though it's just a chord tone leading to a chord tone. And here on the last line, going from the second measure to the third measure, this third of the F7 leads to the root of the B flat also by step. And these resolutions actually sound a little stronger when you listen to the progression. And it's because they're also stepwise approach notes. 
So this leads us to the discussion of stepwise approach notes. As the name suggests, stepwise approach notes are notes that lead into a target note by stepwise motion, i.e. either by half step or by whole step, rather than by a musical leap. If we look at these scientifically, there are four different kinds of stepwise approach notes. You have a step uh, approach by whole step from above, approach by whole step from below, approach by half step from above, and approach by half step from below. So there's only four different kinds of stepwise approach notes. Stepwise motion fits the definition of aurally logical perfectly because of the way this kind of approach note leads directly into the target note that follows it. While the four types of stepwise approach notes above cover all four possible ways that stepwise approach notes could occur in a line, for the purposes of deciding how to use each kind of approach note in the moment, it's useful to further group stepwise approach notes into two basic categories, diatonic approach notes and chromatic approach notes. Diatonic stepwise approach notes. In general usage, the term diatonic means within the tonality or scale without chromatic alterations. For our purposes, this means that a diatonic approach note would already exist within the chord currently being played or be chosen from the scale tones between the chord tones that would be considered within the tonality of that chord. Because of this, we can make several general observations about diatonic stepwise approach notes. One, they tend to sound very logical and don't challenge the ear by bringing in notes from outside the key. Because they are part of the tonality that's happening, they don't create dissonant clashes within the line. In other words, they almost never sound wrong. Because most scales and tonalities contain both half and whole steps, a stepwise diatonic approach note can be any of the four types of stepwise approach notes listed above, and last, because this type of approach note is by definition from within the key, the player must have a solid theoretical knowledge of the progression being played in order to play them consistently. And this last point is very important, especially when you stop to consider that walking bass lines are usually constructed and executed in the moment. Players who consistently construct logical lines are usually those who have absorbed the concept and sound of line construction over a period of years, to the point where the theoretical concepts have been absorbed and internalized so completely that they're automatic. In musical execution, as in most other skills, thought and creativity share the same mental bandwidth. And what that means is that the more you have to think while in the flow of an activity, the less creative you can be. For this reason, it's a good idea to practice creating each type of approach note systematically in the practice room so that when it comes time to perform, you can do so with as little thought as possible devoted to music theory in order to leave your mental bandwidth free to hear and create melodic ideas. So for beginning players, many times they don't like to play diatonic approach notes consistently because you have to have a fair amount of knowledge in order to do that. But we'll move forward with some examples, uh, systematic uh, examples about diatonic approach notes from above and below. So the next few examples will explore how the concept of stepwise diatonic approach notes could be applied to a chord progression like the first eight bars of the song I Got Rhythm, George Gershwin's song, commonly known as rhythm changes. And while there are many ways to harmonize rhythm changes, progressions, these chords in example nine were chosen because they're pretty standard and because they maintain a consistent harmonic rhythm, which helps us focus on the approach notes. So we're gonna use B flat, G7, C minor, F7, D minor, G7, C minor, F7, B flat seven, B flat seven over D, E flat, E diminished seven, B flat over F, G7, C minor, and F7, and that will be our A section for the rest of this example. If we fill in the root of each harmony, or the bass note where the chord is in inversion, uh, as in B flat over D and B flat over F down here, so if we fill in the root or the bass note, the result would look something like this, giving the example 10 is an example of rhythm changes where we've just filled in the roots, and I'm actually going to play rest to make it sound like a little bit of a t uh, two feel, uh, and you'll hear this example twice on the recording.
Next, in example 11, we'll fill, fill in diatonic stepwise approach notes that approach each target from above. And approach notes in all the examples we're going to get from here on out will be drawn without stems so that you can see the target notes have the stems and the approach notes do not. So in example 11, every approach note is a diatonic approach note from above. One other thing I should mention for the rest of this video, for the rest of the examples in the video, you're going to hear each one twice and the first time it, it'll happen at a sort of a medium groove tempo and then so we'll go through the entire example by the time we get to the very last note we're going to start over again at the beginning this time um, twice as fast so that you'll hear it in a up or a medium up tempo so you'll hear the exact same line twice once in a medium tempo and once in an up tempo here then is example 11. So example 11 was all diatonic stepwise approach notes from above. Everything fit into the quarter tonality. Of course, we're in B flat. The only note outside of B flat that we see is this E diminished, which is the passing chord between the E flat and the B flat over F. And now for example 12, we'll fill in diatonic stepwise approach notes that approach each target from below. Okay, a um, couple of asterisks in this one. Because the second chord is a G7, and we're using a G7 instead of a G minor, although the original harmony from uh, Gershwin's I Got Rhythm was a G minor, but for the jazz version of this progression, we're using a G7. Because this chord is a G7, the stepwise approach, diatonic approach note from below would then be a B natural rather than a B flat. And we're gonna, we'll see that three times in the progression here, here, and here. And again, you'll hear it twice, once as a groove tempo and once as a medium up tempo. So one of the interesting things about this example is when you're doing diatonic from approach from below, um, sometimes you can end up, depending on the movement of your progression, you can end up with a lot of repeated notes. And we'll, I've talked about this before and I'll talk about it again. There's, um, there's an urban myth that bass lines should not include repeated notes, that somehow repeated notes are cheating. But I think if you go back and listen to a lot of recordings of a lot of great bass players, you'll discover that there are a lot of repeated notes to be found and this is just one example of them this is a way to approach e flat and e and f and g um, from below the diatonic note you're already on it and so the best way to do it from there is is uh, if you're staying diatonic is simply to repeat the note and it still has a very strong resolution to it so there's several no notable things about the approaches from below in the previous example We've covered a couple of those. G7 leads to C, the B flat is a B natural, and the repeated notes. And I'm including this in the text because this text will also be available as a PDF um, for those who request it. And we'll close this section on diatonic uh, stepwise approach notes with an example, example 13, which mixes both upper and lower diatonic approach notes um, so that you can get sort of the best of both worlds. And here is example 13. Again, first time slow, second time fast.
And this leads us to the concept of chromatic stepwise approach notes. While the term chromatic has sef several different musical definitions, for our purposes, we'll define chromatic approach note as a note that resolves to a target note by a half step from either above or below. This definition allows us to greatly simplify the matter because by using it, we no longer need to concern ourselves with whether or how a note fits into an existing tonality or scale. Rather, by defining the term this way, we admit that what makes this type of note work is its strong tendency to resolve rather than how it fits into a tonality or scale. We can make several observations about chromatic approach notes based on this. One, while the upper and lower chromatic approach notes sound different from each other, both resolutions have an unmista unmistakable sonic logic to them, even when the approach note taken out of context would be a wrong note in terms of the ton tonality or scale of the moment. And we'll talk about this later. But the approach note has its own logic. And so even when it was, even if you analyzed it in terms of, oh wait, it doesn't fit this chord or it doesn't fit this scale, its resolution, in other words, its, its sonic desire, if you will, to resolve to the next target note is unmistakable. So even if it's technically a wrong note, by the time it resolves, it still sounds pretty much like a right note. Chromatic approach notes require no theoretical knowledge on the part of the player other than how to play a half step above or below a target note on the beat right before the target note is played. Some diatonic approach note resolutions, both from above and below, are by half step. For example, in the excerpt above, the diatonic approach note resolution E flat to D at the end of measure two, and we'll scroll back up and get that. E flat to D, this is a diatonic resolution, but as you can see, it's also a chromatic resolution because it's a half step, uh, it resolves down by half step. Uh, so the E flat to D is uh, an example of descending stepwise approach note that is both diatonic and chromatic. Likewise, the ascending A to B flat resolution at the end of measure eight is an example of an ascending stepwise approach note that by our definition is both diatonic and chromatic. And there it is, the A natural of the F7 leading to the B flat, which is the root of the B flat chord. It's both a chromatic approach note and a diatonic approach note. In light of the last point made above, a chromatic approach note will not necessarily have to be written with an accidental when written in musical notation. And so the next few examples explore the sound of chromatic approach notes. First from above, the following example continues this exploration, um, showing the sound of and the notation of chromatic approach notes from above. And in this example, notes that are also diatonic approach notes are marked with an asterisk. So um, several of the examples that we use, while they are half-step resolutions, they are also diatonic resolutions. So uh, approach notes can be both diatonic and chromatic at the same time. Here is example 14. If you notice a lot of these notes, if you analyze them on paper, which we're now looking at, looking at them on the screen, um, are very wrong. This D flat would be the flat five of the G7. This G flat would be the flat five of the C minor. Um, this B natural would be the sharp four of the F7. This E natural would be the sharp four of the B flat seven, etc. But when you hear the example, it makes perfect sense. All of these notes make perfect sense once you hear where they're going. So that's the sound of upper chromatic approach notes. And they tend to sound dissonant against the key often in this type of setting. And this can be somewhat disconcerting to many beginners in line building, but in fact, it's neither a good thing or a bad thing. This dissonance that upper chromatic approach notes tend to have can be a good thing or a bad thing. It's 
mostly something to simply be aware of. The dissonance or wrongness of these notes is actually the very thing that makes their resolution to a right note so effective in terms of tension and release. And next we'll follow with an example of the same progression approaching each target note with a chromatic approach note from below. And again, notes that are also diatonic approach notes are marked with an asterisk. Here then is example 15. And in example 15, I think you'll find that a lot of these notes sound um, much more right than the ones from above. So we'll make a couple of observations about example 15. You also see a lot of accidentals in this example. In most progressions, lower chromatic approach notes are more likely to also be diatonic approach than upper chromatic approach notes are. So if you look in this example, eight of the 16 lower chromatic approach notes were also diatonic approach notes, while in the previous example, only three of the 16 approach notes were also diatonic. There is a theoretical explanation for this, but it's not really important for our purposes here. Notice also that in this example, because of the way the line is built, we ended up with a lot of repeated notes um, w because the motion of the line itself was chromatic. So the best way, for the on really the only way for us to, to have lower chromatic approach notes was to simply repeat the notes that we were on. Much more of interest is the way that most people tend to hear the non-diatonic lower chromatic approach notes as being less dissonant than the upper chromatic ones. This likely has to do with the fact that they sound like leading tones, which have been a staple of melodic resolution in Western music for hundreds of years as the strongest and most foundational kind of imperative aural resolution that the music has to offer. And for our purposes in line building, these two perceptions of chromatic approach notes, from above being more dissonant and from below being more consonant, these can be extremely useful to anyone building a line in real time as it gives the improviser a big picture control over how consonant or dissonant they want their line to be at any given point by making a very simple decision, chromatic from above or below, dissonant or consonant. So a lot of times when you're making a decision, Instead of putting words to upper chromatic, lower chromatic, et cetera, et cetera, you may just be thinking, I'd like a more dissonant note or a less dissonant, less dissonant note, or I'd like a consonant resolution here. But now the, the progression feels like it needs more dissonant, uh, dissonance, a little bit more bite. And a lot of times in the heat of the moment and in the flow of creating a line, that's about all the thought that you may have time for, this general perception of less consonance, more dissonance, or vice versa. Example 16, then, um, combines both types of chromatic approach notes to get the best of both worlds. So this one will have both upper and lower chromatic approach notes. Here is example 16. So at this point, we've systematically examined both diatonic and chromatic stepwise approach notes, looking at and listening to how they each sound when applied to a chord progression from above, from below, and in combination. Rather than attempting to discern which is more useful or somehow better sounding, it's probably best to simply observe that each, each type of approach note is useful in its own way, and that limiting ourselves to only one or two types because we favor them for whatever reason. For instance, many young players tend to favor the chromatic ones because they don't require as much theoretical knowledge as the diatonic ones. So limiting ourselves is, in effect, only limiting our melodic vocabulary that we use to construct our lines. Each of the previous examples works as a clear melodic outlining of the chord changes, with the third example in each category, the example in which the approach notes from above and below are combined. 
exemplifying the most varied usage of that type to construct a line which allows the improvising basis to have some creative input into the contour and sound of the line, while still being able to minimize the number of decisions to be made in real time. And in the end, as improvising musicians, when creating melody, we want our decisions to ultimately be intuitive decisions we make, because we hear with our inner ear that a certain decision will lead to a better melodic line. Practicing building and hearing each of the components of these decisions individually is a great way to build a vocabulary that will eventually result in a natural, intuitive, melodic flow. Our final exam example in this chapter will logically be one which combines all of the previous types of approach notes drawing on the possibilities of each. So example 17 uh, has both upper diatonic, lower diatonic, upper chromatic, lower chromatic approach notes all mixed in together just based on what seemed, I guess, what seemed to me to be the best um, usage of sound in navigating this progression. And of course, this progression can be done a lot of different ways. So the example will be analyzed with notation showing whether each stepwise approach note used is diatonic, which is shown with a D, chromatic, which is shown with a C, or both, which is shown with a C and an asterisk. And of course, both means it's a chromatic approach note, which is also diatonic. Here then is the sound of example 17. The above example uses five diatonic whole step resolutions, five purely chromatic resolutions that are not part of the chord or tonality, and five hybrid chromatic resolutions, half step resolutions that also happen to be diatonic. Having all of these different types of resolution under the fingers and in the ear is important, not only to building compelling bass lines, but also to have the means to vary the melodic content of the lines at will. Remember that this is only one A section of one chorus of what often turns out to be an extended improvisational vehicle. Great improvising bassists tend to vary their lines with each new section and chorus, and it takes a great command of vocabulary to do that in real time. With just these few tools and the ability to vary the octaves in which the target notes are played from section to section and chorus to chorus, a great bassist could create a vast amount of melodic variation out of just these few devices we have discussed here. In our next chapter, we'll begin to discuss building lines on chord progressions where the harmonic rhythm is slower, chords are spaced further apart, resulting in the player having many more choices to make just to get from target note at the beginning of the measure to the approach note that may be three, seven, or many more beats away. In the meantime, there is plenty to practice. That last statement of the chapter, that while you're learning any particular skill, that there's plenty of time to practice is probably one of the great understatements of human civilization. No matter how, how good you get at anything, no matter how much time you put in, there's always room to get better. And I only hope that with this video that uh, some of the ideas put forth, some of the systematic ways of practicing have given some of you some ideas about ways to improve your walking bass lines in one way or another. Um, there will be future videos along the lines of this one of uh, music theory videos, and each one will stick to a a basic topic area. I can't say stick to a basic topic, but it'll stick to a topic area and be basically like another chapter in the book. Also, immediately following this video, probably within a month of this one coming out, uh, there will be another video um, of walking bass lines transcribed and analyzed and played on screen uh, following the format of this one. So what you'll see on those will be uh, several bass lines. One is actually the Rhythm changes intro to this video uh, that you heard. It's really uh, up tempo, about over slightly over 300 rhythm changes. It's about a chorus and a half. And then from a previous video on walking lines, there were two choruses of walking lines on confirmation. One was a very sort of inside line, uh, very traditional sounding line, and then the one at the very end was a more modern sounding line. So there will be a video. Uh, showing transcriptions and analysis of those lines from beginning to end, every note, how every note functions, 
um, and you'll be again, same as this time, you'll be seeing the transcription on one side of the screen and seeing the hands playing the bass on the left. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Uh, thank you for tuning in and I hope to see you for, for future videos.